Morning. Welcome to Redeeming Grace Fellowship. I'm Pastor Dana. If I didn't get to talk to you, really good to see you all. Um, and this mic, we totally did not check it, so it might be weird or give us problems or make weird noises. Um, we've been in a series on 1 Corinthians for about 11 weeks now, and we're going to take a short break, probably just this week. Um, we're going to take a short break from looking at Paul's letter to the church at Corinth. Here's why. On Friday, March 28th, the highly anticipated film Noah, starring Russell Crowe, will be released in theaters all over the country. The trailer looks absolutely incredible, I think. That's totally subjective. You might think it looks horrible, but uh, I think it looks really awesome. Um, it's probably going to be really good. It's probably going to be a blockbuster, I would imagine. Probably great acting, even better cinematography. Um, I can't imagine it being bad. We'll see. Maybe it will totally be horrible and it'll get horrible reviews, but it looks awesome. I know sometimes they take the trailer and they put all of the good, cool scenes in like one minute and the rest of the movie is awful. Uh, hopefully that's not the case, but anyway, in light of the film's upcoming release, I want to take a look at the story of Noah with you for a few reasons. Let me give you those reasons uh, and then we'll pray together. First, I want to take the most of the opportunity um, it's not every day that Hollywood makes a film portraying one of the biggest events in the history of salvation. Um, that is not an opportunity that we are going to get as Christian preachers every week. Um, there are going to be millions, literally, of people all over the country going to see a film about God and his judgment. Um, huge opportunity. So, that's one of the reasons. Second, I want to build a framework for a biblically accurate understanding of the flood narrative in your mind prior to you going to see the film. Um, that doesn't mean I'm one of those guys who is advising every Christian I know not to go see it because I know the film is going to be biblically inaccurate. Um, I'm not that guy. Um, I'm probably going to go see it. I'm not going to rebel against it and say, oh, it's not biblically accurate. I'm not going to go see it. However, I will go into the film knowing I'm not getting my theology on God or his judgment from that movie. So I'm going in knowing that. Likewise, if you go and see this film, I want you to enjoy the film, but I also want you to filter the content of that movie, filter the sermon or the message that that movie is giving you about God through what God actually said about that event. And that's what we're going to do today. Third, the story of Noah is extremely relevant for us because of the way that Jesus used this story to illustrate truth about himself, particularly his second coming, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. And the fourth and final reason for taking a break to look at the story of Noah is to take yet another opportunity to look at the Old Testament scriptures to see how those scriptures point forward to Jesus. We want to get an understanding of that Old Testament where we're not just looking at Noah and the ark as some kind of story that we learned about in Sunday school where just last night my wife was reading um, Delilah, my daughter. She had a birthday party yesterday. She got a bunch of new books. She loves to read books. She'll sit there for hours. And one of them was Noah and the ark. And my wife started reading it out loud and like three words in, I was just like, oh, it's so like, the way they talk about it, it's just... There's no grace. There's no gospel. It's Noah was the only good person left in the world and like had nothing to do with God's judgment. And I know you don't read a two-year-old a story about God killing every person on the planet. That would, but I don't know. There's a way, like the um, Jesus Storybook Bible, good example of how to do things really well and gospel-centered. Most of them are not like that. Um, and this was not like that either. So we're going to look at the Old Testament but look at it the way Jesus told us to, meaning all of it is about him. How does this relate to what he has done? That's what we're going to do today. So we're going to jump into Genesis chapter 6. We're going to be looking at a lot of scripture, though. Be reading a lot of scripture. Hopefully you've got your little rubber thing on your thumb so you can turn fast. It'll all be up here, though, so don't be nervous if you can't find stuff. All the scripture will be up on the screen. You can follow along there. I'm going to pray first, though. Ask God for his help. Ask him to bless our time together. Then we will look at Genesis chapter 6. So let's pray together. 
Father, we thank you for your grace, for your kindness. And most importantly, we thank you for Jesus himself. We thank you that you sent him to save us from our sin and to reconcile us to you. Father, as a church, we gather now, um, and during this time of prayer, we lift up um, those who cannot be with us today. We lift up Josh and his family as they are mourning the loss of his grandfather. I pray you'd be with them, that you'd comfort them, um, that they would find joy in the fact that he is with Jesus now. Um, we thank you for that. I pray for those who are not here due to illness today. I pray in your power and grace you would come with healing in their lives. Lord, for us who have gathered this morning together to worship you, I pray that you would speak powerfully to us from your word. Lord, that you would give us a, a, a biblical understanding for this story about Noah and the ark and the flood and your great salvation so that when we go and see this film, we will have a filter through which we can take all of the content of the movie and run it through that so that we know exactly what your intentions were in revealing this story about Noah to us. I pray that as we worship you over the word, as we look at what you have to say to us this morning, that you would speak powerfully to our hearts, that for those of us here that know you and love you through faith in Jesus, that you would strengthen us, that you would strengthen our faith, that you would help us to dive deeper into the grace that you've given us in your salvation. That we would be overflowing with gratitude for your mercy and your grace. And for those here who perhaps have not received Christ by faith, I pray that you would speak powerfully to their hearts, that you would draw them to faith in the Son as we see your wrath, but also see this great mercy and grace that you've provided in Christ this grace and mercy that you extend to all who will have it if they would repent and believe. So I pray that you would work powerfully over the next 30 minutes or so. We love you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God created the world and everything in it, and he made it good. He made it very good, he says in Genesis chapter 2. That includes our first parents, Adam and Eve. He made them in his own image. He made them in his likeness, and he gave them dominion over the land and the animals. He placed them in the Garden of Eden, and he commissioned Adam to work there and to lead his family. They were given one prohibition in Genesis 2, 16 and 17. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. Satan came to Adam and Eve in the form of a serpent and tempted Eve to partake of the forbidden fruit. In spite of God's clear instructions, Satan persuaded her to doubt God's word and to eventually dismiss God's word, particularly the word about his judgment. And she took from the tree and ate and also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he also ate. In that moment, sin entered the world. In Romans 5.12, the apostle Paul wrote that sin came into the world through one man, Adam, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. All of Adam's offspring, without exception, that's wrong, except for Jesus, all of Adam's offspring have been born in Adam's image and likeness. That is, they've been born into sin and rebellion. We are sinners by nature and by choice. We are born sinful, and we choose to sin. We have all sinned. I have sinned. I have fallen short of the glory of God. We see the devastating effects of sin and the way it manifests itself into the world very quickly after this, as quickly as Adam and Eve's first children, Cain, Adam and Eve's son became jealous and angry with his brother and he murdered him. The Bible reveals in Genesis 4 that one day when Cain and Abel were in a field together, Cain rose up and slew Abel. He murdered his own brother in cold blood. 
that is the chapter immediately after we learn about sin entering the world. One generation. This was the beginning of humanity's downward spiral into sin and violence. A downward spiral that led to the catastrophic event that we're going to look at this morning from Genesis 6. So a little bit more introduction here. In Genesis 5, the author Moses, he's the author of Genesis, he wrote a genealogy and it starts with Adam and Eve's son Seth. He was the son after Cain and Abel. And it ends with Noah and his three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Noah's name means rest and comfort. In Genesis 5.29, we read that Lamech, Noah's father, gave him that name for this reason. Out of the ground that the Lord has cursed, this one, Noah, shall bring us relief from our work and from the painful toil of our hands. Adam's sin had not only brought a curse upon humanity, but also a curse on the land. And ever since, God promised Adam and Eve after that in Genesis 3.15 that he would send a redeemer who would one day come from the seed of the woman and crush the head of the serpent, Satan. God's people were waiting for the arrival of this redeemer, this deliverer. Lamech probably thought Noah would be this redeemer. He was going to bring us comfort. He was going to bring us rest from the painful toil of our hands. Noah was not that redeemer, but what he would experience would point forward to the coming redeemer in more ways than one. And we'll look at that at the end of our sermon today. So after being introduced to Noah and his family in Genesis 5, in chapter 6, we see that downward spiral of sin and violence reappear on the pages of Scripture. God reveals just how sinful we are in this passage. Look at Genesis 6, 5 with me. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. That is not how we like to imagine ourselves as human beings. While this particular passage describes the way that God saw the generation of Noah, the rest of the Bible reveals that this wickedness is not exclusive to Noah's generation. Since the fall of man in the Garden of Eden, every generation before this one and after this one can be described accurately by the words of Genesis 6-5. We are wicked people. We are broken people. Our hearts are evil. Our motives and intentions are stained and marred by sin. One of the Old Testament prophets, Jeremiah, described the sinfulness of the human will and emotions this way in Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? God can understand it. This downward spiral of sin and violence revealed in the wicked hearts of humanity is heartbreaking. Not only to us as we see it happening in our lives, but also to God. In fact, it grieves him. Look at Genesis 6, 6. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. God made us in his own image that we might bring him glory. He made Adam and Eve in his own image and likeness that they might bring him glory as they exercised dominion over all that he had made. They were the crown jewel of his creation, and yet we rebelled against him. And that rebellion placed mankind on a trajectory that would lead to the moment described here in Genesis 6-6 in which God's heart is so grieved by the wickedness of his creatures that he regretted that he made them. 
In this passage, we are given a glimpse inside the heart of God, inside the heart of the Creator, as He looks upon His own creation that had rejected Him and chose to walk in darkness rather than in the light. The heart of a holy God breaks as He looks upon the sin and rebellion of His creatures, upon their brokenness, upon their desperately sick hearts. It grieves him. So with the wickedness and violence of mankind prevailing on the earth and the heart of God being grieved by this evil, God determined that his judgment would fall on the human race. The righteousness of God would lead him to pour out his holy wrath upon those who have rebelled against him. Look at Genesis 6-7 with me. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens, for I am sorry that I have made them. God was going to annihilate all people and the entire animal kingdom. God was going to start over. Verse 7 doesn't reveal how God was going to do this, but if we skip down to verses 11 through 13, and then verse 17 of chapter 6, we see God elaborate on his wrath that would come upon the inhabitants of the earth. Look at those verses with me, starting with verse 11. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence. And God saw the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy the earth. Verse 17. I will bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh in which is the breath of life under heaven. Everything that is on the earth shall die. In verses 11 and 12, the author of Genesis recaps the sinfulness of humanity and the violence that filled the earth. And then in verses 13 and 17, God speaks to Noah and reveals the means by which his wrath would be experienced, namely a worldwide flood. God is very clear in these verses to communicate that this flood was a universal flood, meaning it was experienced globally. This wasn't some kind of local flood unique to Noah's community. This was global. God was going to destroy all flesh in which the breath of life was in under heaven. His wrath would be experienced on a global scale. This flood covered the earth. And in the midst of God preparing to pour out his wrath upon rebellious creatures that were deserving of this wrath, we see the unmerited favor of God fall upon one man and his family. Look at Genesis 6-8 with me. Short verse. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. God looked upon Noah and his family, and rather than pouring out his wrath, he pours out grace. He pours out mercy. The next verse in chapter 6 reveals that Noah was a righteous man that walked with God. And we shouldn't take that verse to mean that Noah's righteousness earned the favor of God in this situation. God didn't look down and find favor on Noah because Noah was a righteous man that walked with God. We know that from a verse in Hebrews 11. We'll read that shortly. It reveals that Noah was an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. That is to say, Noah was a man who believed God and his promises. That's why he was righteous, because he trusted God. He believed God when God spoke. And here in Genesis 6, God comes to Noah providing a way of salvation, a way to be spared from his wrath. Look at Genesis 6, 14 through 18 with me. 
This is God's instructions to Noah. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and out with pitch. This is how you are to make it. The length of the ark, 300 cubits. Its breadth, 50 cubits. And its height, 30 cubits. Make a roof for the ark and finish it to a cubit above and set the door of the ark in its side. Make it with lower, second, and third decks. For behold, I will bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh in which is the breath of life under heaven. Everything that is on the earth shall die, but I will establish my covenant with you. And you shall come into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. God was about to pour out his wrath, but in grace in order to keep the promise to send a deliverer for his people, he preserves them by establishing his covenant with Noah and provides a way of salvation for him and his family. That salvation would come in the form of a gigantic ark that would allow Noah, his family, and a remnant of animals to survive the worldwide flood that God was going to bring upon the earth. And in chapter 7 of Genesis, we see that happen. We see God bring this flood of judgment that destroys absolutely everything with the exception of those in the ark. So in that quick overview of the story of Noah, we've seen the wicked heart of man, the grieved heart of God, the holy wrath of God and the judgment of the flood and the unmerited favor or grace of God that was shown to Noah that was poured out upon him and his family as God saved them from his wrath. Now, as 21st century Christians, what does this flood and the salvation of Noah and his family have to do with Jesus? We know it has something to do with Jesus because Jesus taught his disciples that the entire Old Testament, the law and the prophets and the writings, the way Jesus described the Old Testament, which means all of it, is about him. We're going to look at two ways that this story about Noah, the ark, and the flood pointed forward to the person of Jesus and his work. The first thing we're going to look at together is the relationship between this ancient flood and the return of Christ. To see how the flood foreshadows the coming wrath of King Jesus. And to see this, we're going to look at a big passage of scripture. It's recorded in Matthew 24. It's just Jesus speaking and teaching to his disciples. You can follow along in your Bible or look up on the screen. We'll start in Matthew 24. We're going to look at verses 29 through 31 and then skip down to 36 through 42. So Jesus said the following regarding his second coming beginning in verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then will appear in the heaven the sign of the Son of Man, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Down to verse 36. But concerning that day and hour, no one knows. Not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. For as were the days of Noah, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day when Noah entered the ark, and they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two men will be in the field. One will be taken and one left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and one left. Therefore, stay awake. For you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. 
in this passage, Jesus draws a direct parallel between the days of Noah and his future return at the end of this age. And it is a parallel that Jesus gives, this particular parallel, that causes me to see how relevant this story, this ancient story about a flood in the Middle East, to see how relevant that is for us today. While Genesis 6 describes Noah's generation as wicked and violent, Jesus describes that same generation as one that was just drifting through life, doing business as usual until it began to rain. A generation that will be wicked and violent. Jesus talks about that at the beginning of Matthew 24. There will be wars. There will be rumors of wars. Just look at the violence of our generation. And this isn't like a fear-mongering, Jesus is coming back tomorrow kind of thing. He could, but that's not what this is. Just every generation since Noah, what has, descri- what has been the description of that generation? Violence. We are a violent, wicked, brutal people. There are teenagers playing games, knocking out old people, punching them in the face and recording it on video as fun. That's fun. That is like, if you look up violence in the dictionary, there should be a picture of that. 17-year-olds punching unexpected 80-year-old women in the face and breaking their neck on video and putting it on the internet for fun. That is brutally violent. That is us. That is our generation. That is every generation. But also, we're just kind of drifting through life. Doing things as normal. We're marrying. We're giving in marriage. We're eating. We're drinking. We're enjoying all of these graces that God has given us with no regard for God whatsoever. That's how Noah's generation was acting, and then one day it began to rain. That's how the generation will be acting when Jesus comes back. Despite the patience of God being displayed with that generation as Noah built the ark and preached to his contemporaries, the only people that believed God's word about judgment and got into the ark were Noah and his family. We know that God was patient with the wicked, violent generation of Noah because in 1 Peter 3.20, the apostle Peter writes that very thing, that God displayed Patience with them while the ark was being prepared. God is patient with us. In that same way, Peter, again, also writes in 2 Peter 3.9 that God's patience is being displayed in this very moment as we await the arrival of King Jesus. God's patience is being displayed right now as we wait for Jesus to return. His patience reveals his desire that we repent and trust Christ so that we would not have to experience the coming wrath like Noah's generation experienced the wrath of the flood. We also know that Noah was preaching to his generation prior to the flood coming on the earth. Same apostle Peter describes Noah in 2 Peter 2.5 as a herald of righteousness. To be a herald is to be a proclaimer a preacher. Because Noah believed the word of judgment that God delivered to him and trusted him for salvation, a trust that manifested itself in obedience to building this ark, Noah was compelled to herald or proclaim the coming judgment and to call his generation to repent of their wickedness and violence. As we live on mission in our generation, knowing that Jesus Christ is coming back and that the patience of God will one day run its course, we should be compelled, as Noah was, to be a herald of righteousness, to be a herald of the good news of Jesus Christ that, yes, wrath is coming, but you don't have to experience that. You don't. Christ has provided a way of salvation. The people all around us are living their normal, everyday lives. 
They are eating. They are drinking. They are marrying. They are giving in marriage, just like the people of Noah's generation. And just like the flood of God's wrath came upon them at that time when they did not expect it, the Lord Jesus will return to reign on the earth and make all things new at a time when we don't necessarily expect it. But for those who have not trusted in Christ for salvation from the coming wrath, Paul describes their experience of the second coming of Jesus this way in 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 through 10. The Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might when Jesus comes on that day to be glorified in his saints and to be marveled at among all who have believed because of our testimony to you was believed. So we have seen how the flood of Noah's generation foreshadows the wrath of God that will come upon the unbelieving world on the last day when the Lord Jesus returns in power and glory to consummate his kingdom. The flood anticipates that. The flood foreshadows that coming judgment. Now we're going to look at the relationship between the ark of salvation and the gospel of Christ to see how Noah's ark foreshadowed the saving work of Jesus. And we'll close with this. That phrase, ark of salvation, actually comes from a passage that describes Noah's faith in God, the passage I referred to earlier. The author of Hebrews describes Noah's faith in Hebrews 11.7 this way. By faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear, constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this, he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. Noah's faith in God bore the fruit of obedience leading him to construct this ark of salvation, an ark for the saving of his household. The ark that God instructed Noah to build was the means by which God delivered Noah and his family from his wrath, from his judgment. In the same way, the gospel of Jesus Christ, God's Son, that Jesus died for our sins, all of them, was buried and raised on the third day, all in accordance to the scriptures, that we might have forgiveness and eternal life. In the same way, the gospel is the means by which sinners and rebels like us are saved from the coming wrath that we just finished talking about. There's a direct correlation. The passage that we just read in 2 Thessalonians said that Christ will inflict vengeance on those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of the Lord Jesus. It is coming. And the way that sinners are reconciled to God or come to know God is through obedience of faith. The obedience of faith in the gospel of the Lord Jesus. By faith, Noah and his family entered the ark that God instructed him to build and were rescued from the storm of God's judgment. Likewise, when we repent and trust in Christ by faith, when we trust in his saving work, we are rescued from the coming end time storm of God's judgment. The flood of Noah's generation pales in comparison to what is coming. It cannot even compare to the glory of Jesus that will be revealed when he comes in holiness. And the truth is that there is not one person, including all of us, that does not deserve what is coming. So when you go to see the movie Noah, or if you go see the movie Noah, 
after it's released on Friday, as you watch it, realize that the flood that you see depicted on the screen actually happened and that it was a display of God's judgment upon real people. As you watch it, know that God was patient with those people just as he is patient with us. Know that the flood is pointing to a much greater, more severe display of wrath that is coming, that we all deserve. But most importantly, know that the ark pointed forward to a salvation that is much greater and glorious than the salvation that Noah experienced in the ark. Jesus said that God did not send him into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. God extends grace and mercy to all who will have it if they would turn to Jesus Christ by faith and trust in his saving work. He is patient with us, not wishing that any should perish, but that all come to repentance. There is coming a day when that will change. If you know Jesus this morning, if you have trusted him by faith, let's not just worship him for the salvation that he has given us, but let's leave today knowing that his impending judgment is a reality. It is real. He is coming again. And that patience will be over. We are going to be surrounded by people today and tomorrow and the next day who do not know Christ. And I am ashamed to stand up here and say how many times I fail to open my mouth and say, there is an ark of salvation in Christ. People are perishing eternally. And we have this good news of grace that Jesus saves sinners. He saves them to the uttermost, meaning completely, fully. Jesus saves. People around us need Jesus. You have him. If you're a Christian, tell them about Jesus because he's coming and you won't get to tell anyone else about Jesus after that. They will be separated from the glory of his might, suffering eternal destruction away from his presence. Let's tell them about him and what he has done to save rebels like us from our sin and to reconcile us to him and allow us to enter into eternal joy. If you don't know Jesus, run to him. Receive him by faith and be rescued from the coming storm of God's judgment. Flee the wrath to come because it is coming. Jesus will come back and this time he's not riding into Jerusalem on a donkey. He's coming back on a horse. Revelation says he's coming back on a white horse with a tattoo on his leg with a robe dipped in blood and a sword coming out of his mouth. That's the Jesus that's coming back. Not the Jesus that you see on the paintings in your church. He's holy and he's coming back and he will inflict vengeance on those who do not obey the gospel and who do not know God. That's the Jesus that's coming back. It's King Jesus. He's holy. And if you do not know him, you will be in that category that we read in 2 Thessalonians 1. You will be there. Jesus said that all the Father gives to him will come to him and that the one who comes to him will never be cast out. He is a great Savior. He is a patient Savior. Do not spurn the love, mercy, and grace and patience of God. Trust him this morning. If you have trusted him, let's worship him. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for your grace I thank you that you are a patient God and that you save those who trust you, that you save those who believe your word and you've given us a word. You've given us the word of the gospel. 
You have sent Jesus to show us the fullness of your glory. You have sent Jesus to live a perfect life of obedience, a life that we cannot live. You sent Jesus to die the death that we deserve to die, to pay the penalty that we could never pay. And you've raised Jesus from the dead to show the world that his payment was full and final, that his sacrifice was approved. Father, I just thank you for that grace. I thank you for the joy that we can experience when we repent and trust in Jesus and are made new. Lord, for those of us here who have experienced that, I pray that we would worship you continually, that the imminent return of Jesus would cause us to not only walk in holiness before you, knowing that the time is short, knowing that he is coming back and that we should live for his glory in every moment, but that his return would prompt us and compel us to be heralds of the gospel, to proclaim this good news, to proclaim to the people all around us that do not know you that there is salvation available. Father, help us. Empower us by your spirit to live on mission, to be proclaimers and heralds of righteousness, heralds of the gospel. Father, if there be one here that does not know Christ by faith, I pray that you would draw them to the Son, that you would open their eyes to see Jesus in his glory, and that they would believe, that they would believe this word of good news, that Jesus saves sinners, that he makes us new, that he cures our desperately sick hearts and reconciles us to you for eternity. Lord, we love you so much. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen.